Well, we're back. Hello, opera fans. I'm Jonathan Dean, Seattle Opera Dramaturg, and I couldn't be more thrilled that we have live performances coming to our theater again. Technology has achieved miracles for us these last two years, but there's nothing like getting together in person for old-fashioned analog opera, their voices and instruments buzzing the air that's touching your ears. I can't wait to see you in person at the theater to share once more the stories, the music, the magic that opera creates. This fall, we are giving La Boheme, an opera we originally hoped to present in May of 2020. It's one of the world's favorite shows, a piece which is often described as the perfect opera. La Boheme is perfect and really popular and quite familiar. If you already know La Boheme, think of this production more as a celebration of finally gathering together again as a community instead of a radical or challenging new approach to a familiar piece. There was a recent La Boheme set in outer space, but for Boheme to work, all an opera company really needs to do is follow Puccini's extremely detailed instructions. So, if you're already familiar with La Boheme, when you come to our Seattle Opera production this fall, what will be different is that you're different now on the other side of this pandemic. Listen to the music, pay attention to the show, and pay attention to your own reactions. You may find they surprise you. What I'd like to do in this brief pre-show video with some footage from Seattle Opera's 2013 La Boheme is offer you a little more information about the world of La Boheme, stuff that Puccini didn't include as part of the show. One of the reasons La Boheme is considered a perfect opera is there's no excess, nothing that could be cut. La Boheme isn't very long as operas go. Puccini leaves us wanting more. If you fall in love with these characters, as many have, you can find out more about them by going to the book that inspired La Boheme, or the many other plays, movies, musicals, and operas based on the story. Let me offer some cultural context about this world of bohemian life, about what's known as the Paris demi-monde, that is the world of our two female characters, Mimi and Musetta, and I should tell you a little bit more about Puccini and even speculate on what La Boheme meant to him. We'll start with La Vie Boheme. It's actually something that's a little tricky to define. The word, the name, is just a mess etymologically. La Boheme starts with a book, really a collection of autobiographical short stories about life in Paris in the 1840s. The author, Henri Mourget, disguised himself as this writer named Rodolphe. The other characters were all based on his friends, artists, wannabes, living lives of heartbreak and destitution on the left bank of Paris. They're scrounging for cash and poverty, la misère, relieved from time to time by the pleasures of love, friendship, or the excitement of a sudden and unexpected windfall. Mourget's stories were only known to his own very small, tightly knit community until, in 1849, a play was made out of La Vie de Bohème by a playwright named Barrière. Story goes that when Barrière called on Mourget to ask him if he could make his stories into a play, Mourget had to receive him in bed because his roommate had borrowed his one set of clothes for a job interview. That's bohemian life in Paris in the 1840s. Thanks to the success of Barrière's play, people wanted access to the original stories. So Mourget published them in 1851 as a book called Saint de la Vie de Bohème, Scenes from Bohemian Life. That's pretty much all you need to know about Henri Mourget. He never really made it out of Bohemia and died. Ten years later, he was 38 years old. Mourget described Bohemia as a necessary phase in an artist's life, like being an apprentice. 
that time when, climbing the verdant slope of youth, they had no other fortune in the sunshine of their twenty years than courage, which is the virtue of the young, and hope, which is the wealth of the poor. Bohemia, Merger goes on to tell us, is the preface to the academy, or the hospital, or the morgue. It ends badly most of the time because actually it's really hard to make a living as a professional artist then as now. Puccini's opera doesn't particularly focus on the artistic ambitions of our young bohemian characters. Yes, occasionally we see the guys trying to work. But the opera is far more interested in their love lives than in their careers. But we should take a moment to acknowledge the challenges and perils and the boundaries of this bohemian life. Morget asserted that bohemia only exists and is only possible in Paris. That's a ridiculous overstatement. Bohemia exists because it's tough to make a living as a freelance artist, no matter where or when you live. When Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart quit Salzburg to try to make it as a freelance musician and composer in Vienna, 80 years before Morget's stories, Mozart signed up for the messy life of a Viennese bohemian. Mozart thought it was worth the risk because he wanted independence as an artist. He could have stayed in Salzburg and taken over his father's steady job working for a feudal lord. But Mozart lived through that age of revolution in which people everywhere were casting off ancient shackles and turning against traditional authority. Mozart went freelance. He wrote the music he wanted to write. He didn't always get paid for it. After 10 years of a harsh bohemian existence, he died only 35 years old. So it's not true that artistic bohemia can only exist in Paris, but there was something special about Paris, something that made the starving artist subculture of that city particularly lively. Paris was the epicenter of the Age of Revolution. The intellectuals of Paris led the charge when it came to overturning defunct systems and embracing new freedoms. Following the French Revolution, artists and intellectuals were drawn to Paris like moths to a lamp. There was plenty of money there, thanks to France's colonial empire. In theory, bohemian artists don't value money or the things money can buy. Instead, they care about developing their unique artistic voice or pushing back the boundaries of their art form, saying something that no one has ever said before. If you get a paycheck for producing art, you're no longer a bohemian. The fanatics among them might call you a sellout. But nobody can live on dreams and ideas alone. Case studies of a couple real-life artists who nearly starved to death in Paris in Mourget's day. One such uh, writer-composer used to go with his wife out to the suburbs because they knew where some trees extended out over the sidewalk and they could knock down nuts and thus score a free meal. Their dog ran away because they couldn't feed it and eventually they pawned their wedding rings. Even so, in a memoir, this artist describes a lively evening with friends that sounds like a scene from La Boheme. On New Year's Eve of 1840, I was given a most touching surprise party. My friends appeared with veal, rum, sugar, lemons, that's for making punch, a goose, and two bottles of champagne. The supper developed into a dithyrambic carousal. When the punch began to supplement the effect of the champagne, I delivered a fiery speech, got up on the table itself, and preached to my transported listeners a gospel of the most nonsensical contempt for the world, the whole thing ending only in sobs of laughter, with everyone so overcome that we had to put them up for the night. That's how the great German composer Richard Wagner remembered his days as a Paris bohemian. Another real-life starving artist in Paris at the time was Hector Berlioz, whose love life could be a story from La Boheme. 
Berlioz famously composed his Symphony Fantastique out of his obsession with the Irish actress Harriet Smithson. Her performances as Ophelia and Juliet had turned his world upside down and made him resolve to develop his artistic gifts until they matched hers. He wanted to be worthy of her. In his memoir, Berlioz describes their wedding. In the summer of 1833, Harriet Smithson being bankrupt and still weak, I married her in the face of the violent opposition of her family and after having had to resort to legal action with regard to mine. On our wedding day, she had nothing in the world but her debts and the dread of never being able to make a complete return to the stage. I, on my side, possessed the total sum of 300 francs lent me by a friend. Once again, I had quarreled with my parents, but she was mine and I defied the world. Actually, it was a terrible marriage. As his star rose, hers fell, and she became so possessive and jealous of him, eventually it destroyed their relationship. But it's difficult to blame her. In the society in which they lived, a married woman was supposed to be her husband's inspiration and status symbol, not his partner, and certainly not his equal. In fact, women who appeared on public stages, like Smithson, were automatically suspect. She couldn't be both an actress who was a talk of Paris and a respectable wife. Which brings us to the demi-monde, another contextualizing element that may help make sense of La Boheme. The opera features six young characters who are usually called the Bohemians, Colline, Chonard, Mimi and Rodolfo, Marcello, and Musetta. But to be very clear, our soprano characters, Mimi and Musetta, are not Bohemian artists. That world was closed to women. 19th century France wasn't the handmaid's tale exactly, but as you climb its social ladder, opportunities for women become more and more restricted. And at the same time, there's the demi-monde, the half-world, the world of La Traviata, of independent women who work as courtesans and thereby accumulate their own wealth and status. La Boheme doesn't go into the details, but when we first meet Musetta, she enters on the arm of a wealthy and doddering old fool, Alcindoro. His character only exists so the Bohemians can swindle him. The idea is he's already spending a lot of money to go on a date with Musetta. She'd much rather be with her penniless former sweetheart Marcello, who's a painter and who probably first met her when she modeled for him, one of the few opportunities Bohemian artists had to interact with women. They certainly couldn't afford courtesans. Musetta appears in an Italian opera, but she's almost a dictionary definition of a familiar French character type, the coquette. It's more than just being a big flirt. The word derives from coq, rooster, and Musetta certainly struts around the barnyard in this ostentatious and showy way. In an aside, Mimi actually remarks that, kind of pathetic, poor girl, she sings. Technically, Mimi is what was called a glissette, meaning a woman who worked with textiles as a seamstress or in a factory, earning very little money, but independent in that she wasn't considered the property of her father, brother, or husband. If you remember Fantine from Les Miserables, it's a slippery slope from grisette to prostitute. Like Fantine, Mimi, who's all kindness and generosity, doesn't really stand a chance against the harshness of the world, let alone the weakness and vanity of men. In Acts 3 and 4 of La Boheme, Rodolfo claims to be jealous of an offstage character known as the Viscount, 
apparently some wealthy friend of a friend who's sweet on Mimi. But if that's more than Rodolfo's insecurity and paranoia, if Mimi really aspired to be the kept woman of such a man, well, obviously he didn't keep her because she shows up in Act 4, penniless and alone, in order to die in her Rodolfo's arms. I'd like to switch tracks now and speculate a little about what this opera might have meant to Puccini. La Boheme is Puccini's first astonishing masterpiece. Not his first opera, but the first time he hit the ball out of the park. He was almost 40 years old. Not an old man, and not yet a great success, but his days of Bohemia were now behind him. Puccini was just old enough to look back on the poverty of his youth and the intensity of his early relationships with the distance necessary to achieve nostalgia. Nostalgia is the reason La Boheme is such an overwhelmingly powerful opera. Longing for home, desire for a long-lost golden age, regret for a youth and a life which maybe wasn't all smiles and sunshine, but which was ours. Nostalgia will be one of Puccini's main themes in opera after opera for the rest of his career, and he starts writing that great music with La Boheme. Near the end of La Boheme, there's a wonderful piece known as the Coat Aria, sung by the bass who plays Colline. Mimi is sick and dying. They need money to buy medicine. And Colline is heading up the hill to the pawn shop to get rid of this nasty, threadbare old coat, which has become a second skin for him during his many years as a Paris bohemian. When sung properly, his adio, his farewell to the coat, is absolutely heartbreaking. It's the same music that we'll use to weep for the death of Mimi a few minutes later, a sneaky and emotionally manipulative trick Puccini learned from Richard Wagner. The music blooms in your ears and in your heart when you hear it a second time. Anyways, personal story. As many of you know, I've worked for Seattle Opera for a long time. I spent a great deal of my youth in that old building over there at 1020 John Street. The opera company used that place as our headquarters for decades before moving into our glorious new home here in 2018. That old building was charitably described as being a building at the end of its useful life. It was a dump an eyesore, and we'd long outgrown the place. And yet, for me, the memories, the experiences I'd had in that building ran deep. I'll never forget the last time I walked through that place. It was empty. We'd already moved everything out and over to the new place. There was just a little trash rolling around like tumbleweeds in this vast, empty warehouse. And suddenly, on autoplay in the back of my head, I hear Colline's coat aria. Farewell, old friend. I can't believe it's really the end after all this time. Ah, don't look back or you'll turn into a pillar of salt. Nostalgia can be a very powerful emotion. 
Puccini turned it into a pile of money. But La Boheme isn't just nostalgic. It's also a forward-looking opera, the work in which Puccini emerged victorious from the struggle to succeed Giuseppe Verdi, the piece that showed artists and the whole world the way ahead. Now, Verdi had dominated Italian opera since the 1840s, but it was now the 1890s, time for the octogenarian to retire to make way for the young people. The strong new voices in Italian opera were the composers of the Verismo school, Pietro Mascagni, Puccini's old college roommate, and Ruggero Leoncavallo, who worked on a libretto for Puccini and gave him the idea for La Boheme. Those two both achieved fame and fortune with their beloved one-act operas, Cavalleria Rusticana of Mascagni, premiered in 1890, and Leoncavallo's Pagliacci, opened in 1892. Then, in 1893, Verdi releases his final opera, Falstaff, the same month that Puccini's opera, Manon Lescaut, has its world premiere. Manon Lescaut demonstrated Puccini's astounding fertility of melodic invention and his skill at orchestration. But as a show, it's nowhere near as strong as La Boheme. I think what happened is Puccini studied Falstaff carefully, studied the way Verdi and his brilliant librettist jammed that opera so full of wit and brilliance and melodic fecundity and human wisdom Falstaff has the most frivolous story, and yet Verdi makes of it this glorious celebration of human life by packing every bar with delicious tunes and humor and variety. It's an opera you have to listen to multiple times. It's almost too dense to get everything in just one hearing. La Boheme is similarly jam-packed with delights, super concentrated with the tricks Puccini learned from Falstaff. Maybe it's a harbinger of our distracted modern age. One of the characteristics of these operas is multitasking. There's always more than one thing going on in La Boheme, particularly with the ensembles. Ever since Mozart, opera composers had relished writing ensembles where multiple characters express their various feelings all at the same time. But in the older kind of opera, they have to stop everything else to do so. When they sang those big ensembles, the story is momentarily on pause. And on stage, they're often all just staring at the conductor so that musically they'll be in sync. In Falstaff, Verdi changed all that. That opera has plenty of characters and lots of ensembles. And then Verdi subdivides his ensembles into little mini ensembles where the women are chattering in 6-8 over on stage left while the guys are conspiring in 4-4 over here. And meanwhile, the tenor is still singing his love song somewhere else. That's the kind of picture-in-picture -picture opera Puccini keeps giving us in La Boheme. In Act One, look for the scene where Chonard is singing his big aria about killing the parrot, based on one of Murger's stories. It's not that compelling a story, so Puccini, at the same time, has the other three guys setting the table for a feast, completely ignoring their friend who has so generously provided them with all this food. In Act Two, that outdoor cafe scene at the Christmas market is packed full of lifelike little vignettes. And in Act Three, 
Listen for the lover's quartet at the end, really a double duet with one pair of lovers cooing like turtle doves while the others fight and bicker. Instead of music simply adding to life, in this kind of scene, music is multiplying life by life, creating something tremendously exciting. It's something you can only really witness inside an opera house. I look forward to sharing La Boheme with you there. Thanks for being part of Seattle Opera.